Joshua chapter 6, 1 through 20. Joshua chapter 6. It says, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days, and seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horns, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. I'm going to stop reading right there. But Joshua 6, verse 1 through 20, the gates of Jericho are closed because they're in fear of the children of Israel. The Lord's already promised Joshua the victory over the king and the mighty men of Jericho. And compare this to how me and you I've already been promised something. We've already been promised victory over sin, hell, death, the grave. Read that in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. We've got the victory. And you know, our celebration should be nothing like a NBA or NFL player celebration when they score a touchdown. It's not like when a baseball player hits a home run. It's not like when a basketball player celebrates after he just slam dunked and then doesn't even get back on defense, you see. You know, they they stop and celebrate when they should be already getting back on defense so the other team doesn't score. You know, we got the victory, but our reaction should be putting in as much effort as we would if we didn't have the victory. Like, if I slam dunk it, I don't want to act like an animal and start celebrating i want to get immediately get back and focus and pretend that i don't have the victory that way i get even more of a victory you know god will take us all as starters if we are willing you know i don't want to be a bench warmer or a spectator on the winning team i want to be in the action at the second coming you know the battle of jericho is a picture of of the battle at the second coming. And here are some things that you need to do now so that when Jesus Christ comes in victory, you can be a highly decorated soldier of the cross at the judgment seat of Christ. Celebrating the victory is a lot different from the Christian soldier that is in it for the world. Here are some things to do before you experience the ultimate victory in the battle of that great day. Number one, show your footprints before the battle. Show your footprints before the battle. Think about it. As Israel went around the city with all their men of war, in Joshua 6, 3, it says, And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once, thus shalt thou do six days. This would have put even more fear of God in the inhabitants of Jericho. Jericho, You need to show your footprints before the battle. You know what you need to do? You need to walk the walk. In Romans 16, 20, Paul says, God is going to bruise Satan under your feet shortly. That's the second coming. You need to get your feet used to taking a beating. I mean, I know you're going to get a glorified body, but you know what I'm saying? You need to walk the walk while you're here. You need to get your feet used to taking a beating just as much as you would if you weren't going to get a glorified body and you were going to go into battle with this vile body. You know, in Romans 10, 15, it says, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Are you leaving your footprints before the battle? Are, are you leaving some beautiful footprints? You know, we're fighting a battle that's already been won. This battle down here is just pre-season matches before the big day 
when he steps out on the mountains. And Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. He's coming down to literally touch the ground. Not like the rapture where we meet the Lord in the air. At the second coming, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Are you leaving some footprints before the battle? Leave your footprints on this world with the gospel, earning your right to place your feet on it and reign with him when he comes back. 2 Timothy 2.12 If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. So you got to walk the walk. You got to show your footprints before the battle. You got to walk the walk, witnessing as you go. Now look at Joshua 6 and verse 6. It says, And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. He said, For the priests to take up the ark of the covenant. When Jericho saw the marching around the city, bearing the ark, they had to know it had to do with the mighty God of Israel that they're so afraid of. Because why would they be carrying that ark around, you know? You know, when we're compassing about, like Israel was compassing about Jericho, we're compassing about this present evil world, as Paul calls it in Galatians 1.4. We're putting movement to our faith. There ought to be something that shows the lost world that we serve the mighty God of the Scriptures. That ark of the covenant, it showed them that's got something to do with that mighty God that parted the Red Sea. The ark pictures the presence of God. And as a born-again Christian, you're compassing about this world with the Spirit of Christ in you. Colossians 1.27, you got Christ in you, the hope of glory. Are you being a good ambassador? You know, if Ephesians 6.20 calls us ambassadors. Are you being a good ambassador? Joshua said to him, he said, You shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout, then shall ye shout. This reminds me of how, even if I'm not speaking, I should be compassing my city in a way that rem will remind the world of God of judgment and putting the fear of the Lord in the mightiest of men. The fact Israel compassed the city seven days before they went in reminds me of the long-suffering of God. He was giving the inhabitants a chance to run for Rahab's house. Remember, Rahab's house was like the Noah's Ark for Jericho. Rahab's house was the blood of Jesus Christ for Jericho. That's why she had that scarlet thread. Now, verse 17, if you look down at verse 17, it says, And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. You see, Rahab's house would be like the Noah's Ark for Jericho. And you should want to persuade the players on the devil's team to switch sides so that they can come in and celebrate celebrate the victory with you. But you you got to show your footprints before the battle. Number 2, you got to be strapped and ready for the battle. Look at Joshua 6:9. Joshua 6:9 it says and the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets and the re reward like the rear, the rear end came after the ark, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. So the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets. They had armed men go before the priests that were bearing the ark of the covenant, and then seven priests had trumpets. So you need to be strapped and ready for the battle. You need to have the sword by your side ready to go, sounding out like a trumpet. Verse 13 and Joshua rose up early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord, and seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns 
before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets, and the armed men went before them, and the re reward came after the ark of the Lord, the priest going on and blowing with the trumpets, sounding out like a trumpet. Seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets, and the armed men went before them. You got to sound out like a trumpet. If you're strapped and ready for battle, pull that Bible out. That's your trumpet. You sound out like a trumpet. Paul tells the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 1 8, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord. You can't sound out the word if you don't carry it with you. Even if you don't carry it with you, you, you I mean you got it in your heart, I hope. But if you don't carry it with you, you, you won't ever hide it in your heart. You're not strapped with it. You know, if too many of you leave your trumpet at home. You let it get sunburnt in the car or have it full of dust in a, in a drawer somewhere. Those, those trumpets would put the inhabitants of Jericho in fear. And Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, 2 Corinthians 5.11, if you never carry in your trumpet, how are you going to warn the unruly? How will you persuade a Christian? to live right in light of the judgment seat of Christ. You see, at the second coming, the Lord will have a sharp sword coming out of his mouth. Is that sharp sword coming out of your mouth? You've got it in your lap. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Are you, doing, are you doing anything in this practice run that we're in? Are you doing some practice for the real thing? Is that sharp two-edged sword coming out of your mouth? Are you sounding out like a trumpet? Or are you not even strapped and ready for battle? A lot of people, they're just murmuring and complaining. You need to stop your murmuring and complaining. That's the only thing coming out of your mouth. Verse 10, it says, And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth, until the day that I bid you shout, then shall ye shout. I, I don't know, maybe he thought they'd just start complaining about how bored they was walking around like that or how stupid they felt or how they thought, well, these people don't understand me or something. They were busy being quiet or blowing the ram's horns. They were too busy being quiet, playing the quiet game and blowing the ram's horns to complain like their fathers complained. Think about that. Hello, you have the victory. You are a born-again believer, so why gripe? Peter said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4.11. If you're doing that, you won't have time to complain. You're complaining and murmuring so much because you always leave your trumpet at home. In Isaiah 58.1, it says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. The Bible's your trumpet. And you're leaving it at home too much. Too many Christians walk around like a violin at a funeral. And they only, they only sound the trumpet when they do their alms before men. Over there in, in uh, Matthew 6, 2. Over in Matthew 6 and verse 2. It says, Therefore when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. They've got their reward. They're sending the trumpet before men to get credit for it. But the trumpet should direct people to the Almighty, not to yourself through your complaining and self-promoting. But you, you, you're going to have to show your footprints before the battle. You're going to have to be strapped and ready for the battle. You're going to have to be the next thing, steadily doing the same manner, the same things, just different days. Doing the same thing, just a different day. It's repetitive thing. Verse 14, it says, And the second day they compassed the city once and returned into the camp. So did they six days. So they're doing the same thing over and over. Six days straight they compassed the city once. Verse 15, on the seventh day, 
They rose early and did the same compassing of the city after the same manner seven times. So you're steady doing the same manner, just different days. You can't celebrate the victory for very long if you lay down after you get it. Israel got right back up the next day and did the same thing over and over. You got the victory when you got saved. Don't lay down. Just hit the books the next day. Go exercise yourself rather unto godliness the next day. 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. You know, a lot of athletes hit the gym the day after winning the championship. They're doing this for a corruptible crown. How much more should you do it for an incorruptible one that 1 Corinthians 9.25 talks about? You must live your life one day at a time. Tell yourself that you're going to rise early about the dawning of the day. Just like they said in verse 15, it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. Tell yourself you're going to rise up early in the morning about the dawning of the day and live the victory one day at a time. If you're serving God day by day, looking for that blessed hope that Titus 2.13 talks about, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, you're going to be selling, you're going to be celebrating the victory all the way up until he calls you out because you're doing the same manner every day. Now, the next thing, store heavenly treasure before the great battle. Verse 17, it says, And the city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein, to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And then in verse 19, or verse 18, it says, And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves a curse, when ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel a curse, and trouble it. And all the silver and gold, and the vessels of brass and iron, are consecrated unto the Lord. And they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So, verse 17, it said, The city shall be accursed. Verse 18 says, keep yourself from the accursed thing. And then verse 19 mentions the silver and gold and brass that are to be taken into the treasury of the Lord. So you're storing heavenly treasures before the battle. If you're going to be doing that down here, you've got to stay away from the accursed stuff. You need to lay down earthly trophies. Uh, this reminds me of how there are things down here that are accursed and they'll cause me to lose out on rewards, just like Achan. I'm going to lose out on rewards if I go after the accursed stuff. There are saints down here that are celebrating victory the wrong way. You know, like in the NBA, they pop champagne bottles after a victory. That's just messing around with the accursed stuff. They're going after the accursed things, abusing the grace of God with no concern with the treasury of the Lord. There are saints down here that are only celebrating their earthly victories, obtaining corruptible crowns. They hold their temporary trophies up really high. They're not taking any thought for the treasury of the Lord. You know, like Achan and Joshua 7, they sell out to the world. They're busy hiding away their goodly Babylonian garment. And all it's going to amount to is wood, hay, and stubble. They're you need to lay down the earthly trophies. And you need to lay up treasures in heaven. Certainly there are temporary rewards down here. But then there is silver, gold, and precious things I can grab. Those amount to treasures in heaven. And Israel did exactly as the Lord said. When they heard the sound of the trumpet, they shouted with a great shout. The walls fell down. They took the city. In verse 20 it says, the, So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with the great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Israel did exactly what the Lord said. The walls fell down, they took the city. Down here, you got to run your ways, climb the walls, take the city. This way, you can really celebrate the victory on the other side and take your city. Luke nineteen seventeen. So Paul says... So run 
that ye may obtain. 1 Corinthians 9.24 We presently have the victory, but we're still running like we don't have the victory. You know, these are practice matches down here for the real battle. And one of these one of these days, the saints will follow the Lord into victory. The saints will go up the walls into the city, just like they did here in Jericho. Over in Joel 2, 7, it talks about how we're going to run up on the walls. We're going to climb up on the housetops. We're going to enter in at the windows like a thief. You know, those who win corruptible crowns can show you a great deal about how you should strive for incorruptible crowns. You know, the athletes, through their dedication and consistency and hard work, they can show you a great deal of what to do. But they can also show you a great deal of what not to do. So many times you see a team celebrating a victory before the clock runs out and they lose the game. Celebrating victory isn't laying down and gloating. Celebrating victory should be done by you keep fighting and, you, and keeping the victory. You know, when a team has won a championship, sometimes they'll have a parade. That reminds me of Israel's parading around Jericho, showing them what victory looks like. You're not going to have anyone come to Rahab's house if you're walking around without the victory. Uh, we don't want to keep the victory to ourselves. We should be shouting the victory from the rooftops until the walls fall down. You know, people have walls and fortifications around their heart even. They're like Jericho that shut the gates on you. They shut the gates. They wouldn't let anyone in or anyone out. And if Israel had attacked the land 40 years earlier and got the victory there, perhaps those fortifications wouldn't be as thick. And if we get to the heart of sinners quicker, perhaps they won't be as hard-hearted. And we need to try our best to share the victory with them, taking no pleasure in the loss of the wicked.